Coming up on Market to Market, egg buyers push the door wide open on the cage-free movement. Government officials work to take an insecticide off the shelf. And the apple industry blossoms beyond three varieties. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cub next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sukup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, March 4 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. An increase in the number of jobs may be helping to ease recession fears as Americans go back to work. According to the Labor Department, the unemployment rate held steady at 4.9 percent last month as employers created 242,000 new jobs. Higher pay lured many back into the game. Wages have increased 2.2 percent over the last year, a 15 percent increase over the previous 12 months. Some economists believe the positive news may pave the way for the Fed to raise interest rates mid-year. The combination of encouraging employment statistics and positive earnings reports move the Dow Jones Industrial Index over the 17,000 mark at the end of the week. The increase in jobs has the potential to create more disposable income, allowing Americans to plan for the future, spend a few bucks on big-ticket items, and have enough left to put food on the table. USDA statistics reveal the average family spends 13 percent of their wages on food. One sector receiving a portion of that income is the egg industry. The American Egg Board claims 2014 per capita consumption topped 260 eggs annually. And consumers have helped hatch a new trend in egg production. This week, two major players in the U.S. food industry joined several other businesses who, within the past year, have announced their intentions to source eggs laid only by cage-free hens. Chicago and Pittsburgh-based food powerhouse Kraft Heinz Company uses eggs to make products like mayonnaise and salad dressing. The company says the move is part of its efforts to improve sustainability and their 2025 deadline for North American markets gives producers time to adjust their operations. According to USDA, cage-free ventures accounted for just over 3% of all domestic egg production as of March 2015. And with a bevy of brands under its belt as well, Boise, Idaho-based Albertsons Companies, the nation's second largest supermarket chain, said their cage-free plans are a response to customer buying habits and part of an ongoing commitment to animal welfare. Many have declared the cage-free movement nearly unstoppable since fast food chain McDonald's, which purchases over two billion eggs annually in the U.S. and Canada, made a similar decision last September. Most food producers, retailers and restaurants pledging to go cage-free say they will do so within the next five to ten years. But some franchises, like Burger King and Taco Bell, plan to switch over as early as next year. Animal rights groups like the Humane Society of the United States have advocated the shift due to concerns over the quality of life for caged hens. HSUS officials say many egg layers are kept in cramped conditions that prevent them from spreading their wings or walking around. Opponents of the cage-free movement say the method is not as humane or healthy as options like free range, while others believe the practice would eliminate choice in the grocer's aisle. But those in favor claim it is the most easily implemented, large-scale way to improve living conditions for broods among top egg-producing states. Since 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency has kept watch over the effects of pesticides and herbicides on humans, animals, and aquatic life. 
After more than 45 years, the watch continues. Recently, EPA proposed changes to how the herbicide Paraquat is transferred from holding tanks to applicators in order to prevent accidental poisoning. This week, government officials began work to pull one more chemical out of circulation they feel is hurting the environment. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency took steps this week to withdraw the insecticide flubendiamide, sold by Bayer Crop Science and Nichino America. In late January, the EPA asked the companies to voluntarily stop selling flubendiamide-containing insecticides. Agency officials said the insecticide is more toxic in water habitats and appeared to harm the larva of the harlequin fly. Bayer sells the product under the brand name Belt, which is approved for use on more than 200 varieties of vegetables, nuts, and row crops. Germany-based Bayer Crop Science and Japan-based Nichino America, which uses the brand names Vetica and Turismo, refuse to voluntarily set the chemical aside. Bayer officials said EPA relied too much on computer models rather than Bayer's real-world tests. Company officials also said the ponds used for testing may have been holding decades' worth of field runoff, which might amplify the harlequin fly's apparent difficulty in emerging from the larval stage. In 2008, Bayer and Nichino were given the green light to use flubendamide in their product lines. The insecticide kills the larvae of butterflies and moths that can harm crops. Bayer estimates that Belt is used on two to two and a half million U.S. acres annually. These include nuts and vegetables in California and tobacco and soybeans in southern states like Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and North Carolina. No human health concerns have been identified, but stream and river tests found evidence of the insecticide in 14 states. Officials with Bayer sent a letter to the EPA stating the federal government's move denies both companies their due process rights. They are seeking an administrative hearing to fight the EPA's plan, saying removal of this important tool will have negative impacts on growers, the nation's food supply, and the environment. The federal government says sales and use of flubendamide products can continue until the withdrawal process is finalized. Red Delicious Apples, one of the most popular varieties, can trace its roots to trees grown in Madison County, Iowa. The Crispy Delight is but one of more than 7,500 types believed to exist worldwide. But new varieties are being brought into the fold every year as cultivar, soil, and sunlight mix to create the next favorite flavor. Peter Tubbs explains. A generation of broadening consumer tastes has resulted in a more diverse produce section in America's grocery stores. The common apple may be the best example. Once dominated by red and golden delicious, even value grocery stores stock multiple varieties of apples from the spectrum of flavor and texture. Considering that 60% of the growing apple market are eaten fresh, unique varieties drive revenue. The quest for new varieties continues at this lab at Washington State University, including a new variety dubbed Cosmic Crisp. Cosmic Crisp is, is really the first big release that, uh, that Washington, the Washington industry is going to have all to itself. Seeds will be limited to growers in Washington State, ensuring the 20 years of development will see a local payoff. The licensing of premium varieties diversifies both growers' revenue streams and options for consumers. We're really taking what used to be a big macro market and, and cutting it into smaller and smaller pieces with these new varietal apples. The specialty brands drive a higher wholesale and retail price than commodity varieties like Red Delicious, increasing revenue for growers with a fixed acreage for fruit trees. But Cosmic Crisp will have to carve out space in an already crowded specialty apple market, led by established hybrids like Fuji and Gala. The first Cosmic Crisp trees will be planted this year, with apples expected to appear on grocery shelves in 2019. It will be up to the apple itself to find new fans willing to pay its price. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Next, the Market to Market Report. Rain in southern states, price parity in foreign ports, and higher South American crop estimates made for mixed grain markets. 
For the week, May wheat gained 8.5 cents, while the nearby corn contract lost a penny. Limited farmers selling in anticipation of next week's supply and demand report and good export sales pushed the May soybean contract 15 cents higher. May meal followed suit, rising 10.30 per ton. In the softs, the May cotton contract lost 42 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, April Class 3 milk futures gained 6 cents. In the livestock sector, the April cattle contract lost 65 cents, April feeders fell 62 cents, and the April lean hog contract declined a nickel. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index lost 8 tenths of 1 percent. The April crude oil contract rose $3.14 per barrel. COMEX gold gained $50.30 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index bumped up more than 14 and a half points to settle at 314.15. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Always a pleasure. And we are excited to have you here. It was an interesting close to the trading week uh, this week. I want to talk about this wheat market first. We're up eight and a half cents in wheat. We, do we have the momentum to keep going? I think so. I think that grains in general are probably on an upward bounce inside long-term neutral ranges, right? They're bouncing up and down and they're at that low end and they're bouncing upwards alongside lots of other commodities and fueled by the lower dollar. That was definitely, you talk about an exciting week here at the end, that was definitely the excitement. And let's talk about that. On Friday, the dollar fell in its biggest drop in at least several weeks. What precipitated that, do you think? It was absolutely the jobs report. I was watching, and at 7.29 a.m., the dollar was higher. By 7.31, it was, you know, a percentage point off of its weekly high. So probably some trader or group of traders were disappointed by that jobs report. Now, the jobs number was good, but maybe the wage growth disappointed them, or for whatever reason, they're certainly not a big expectation for an interest rate rise in March, although I, go, I know you guys just mentioned probably one in June perhaps is still the idea. So I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of second guessing and guessing about interest rate rises and the entire economy at this point. Could this have been the first big drop to maybe signal the next leg lower here in the dollar? Oh, I don't know. I think that the dollar long term in 2016 will be strong and it's got potential to come right back up to the level where it was or, or even move higher. We're, we're definitely off the 2002 highs still. I mean, there's lots of room for the dollar to get stronger. Okay. Now, as we're, as we're talking wheat, with this dollar break here on Friday, probably the opportunity for it to rally as we go into the future. Do you mark it on this, this rally we've got right now? Not necessarily no okay. like I said we're so far if we if we're in a long-term neutral zone and we're gonna bounce up and down and we're at the bottom of a bounce right now I think you let it you let it churn a little bit higher here can we touch five dollars I think so sure yeah I mean then the spring wheat market is you know it's near that five dollar level and that's the one where people are making decisions you know planting decisions March is the time frame for this battle for acres and the spring wheat price comparison to corn right now is fairly normal historically so so that's in the mix all right well now you mentioned corn let's talk about corn off a little over a penny on the week is there anything bullish to get excited about in this corn market not particularly, no. I mean, it's but it's stable. I mean, I'm, I'm neutral about the corn market. I can't think of any bullish news items for you right now other than just um, the second guessing and guessing about acres. So I think the tone throughout the month of March is going to be bearish because we're expecting to see 90 million acres. Um, we could expect to see larger crops being projected out of Brazil and, and Argentina. So we could have lots of bearish news items churn through this month. And unfortunately, we're already down at the bottom of the trading range. So there's danger uh, of hitting some stops and, and expanding the trading range even lower. But overall, I think it, it, this is the price. It's fairly neutral. Okay. Now, we've got a question here from one of our Twitter followers. This is from Phil in Ontario, Canada at Agridome. He's wondering, is the bottom of this corn market, is that price level determined by algorithms or algorithmic trading? Are we to a value level yet for them? I, sure. Well, okay. So the, the, the speculators, um, and those are the kinds of traders that would be trading based on these algorithms, uh, they are net short for corn. They probably have about, about 1.9, or let's say two sh short bearish positions for every long position that they have. Now, how low that they can make that go, 
like I said, I think that we're near the bottom of the 350 has some support just psychologically and hopefully algorithmically too. Um, but there's no natural, I mean, we were below the cost of production already. So there's no natural fundamental floor that we can put there, you know, without knowing what sort of statistics are behind any individual algorithm. Okay. So probably stay in this range until we break out of it. Hopefully fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully fingers crossed possibly to the upside. Yeah. Once we get through March with it's bearish news. Yes, yes, hopefully. If we can make it through that pl plantings report, maybe even get a bullish surprise if people don't plant 90 million acres, then yes, I think there is certainly potential for it to move higher within that range. Okay. Now let's take a look at the soybeans because they were kind of the headline stealer on Friday. Flat on the week until Friday rallied 13 to 15 cents. Yeah. Talk to us about that soybean market. What happened on Friday that changed it? Isn't that great? A double digit movement of any, of any direction. I'm excited to see it in any direction just to see something moving. But I think they were certainly motivated by the cheaper dollar. I mean, you have a cheaper dollar, all of the grains are going to move higher and soybeans just as, as a ratio, they're, they're going to get those double digits. Um, fundamentally, I don't know that there was anything that really justified that kind of a move yet. Um, there was talk of you know rain in Brazil hampering harvest, but harvest is running ahead of pace already. Let's not panic about that just yet. There was also some late in the week talk of a trucker strike or prospective trucker strike going on in Brazil. Would a disruption of that size, and we've seen these strikes happen year in and year out in Brazil, would that be enough to continue this momentum forward, or are we just watching short covering at this point? No, sure. The American soybean market is definitely in a position to take advantage of that. So their their exports, their corn exports, certainly got some numbers that they are running very far ahead of previous paces because they have built so much capacity to export their grain. So anything that threatens that, yeah, the, the U.S. market is very competitive price-wise, you know, port to port. Our... Our, despite our dollar problems, we are still very competitive. So there's certainly opportunities for the U.S. soybean market to take advantage of disruptions. As we look out to this fall, should growers be pricing any grain, in your opinion, particularly beans, on this rally? Not on this rally necessarily, okay. but should they be, yes, they should absolutely be prepared to be doing some pre-harvest hedging, whether it's this spring or this summer. That is going to be key in 2016 because we have no reason yet to believe that there's going to be a production disruption, that we're not going to have a normal crop. We could have a very record-setting crop. We could have really wonderful weather if El Nino you know, fades and La Nina doesn't show up until late fall and we have this nice dry harvest. It could be perfect growing conditions. So we've really got to be thinking about locking in prices earlier rather than later so far. Given that we are in most crops underneath the cost of the average producer's uh, cost of production, do you have a price level that you like for guys to, for producers to start making those sales? Uh, sure. I mean, for corn, let's say if you, there's resistance at $4 in the December contract. So soybeans, you, you know, you'd love to see a $10 number, but I don't think you're going to see it. So I okay. just don't be too aggressive. Okay. All right. Be alert and be, yeah. be aggressive, but not be, too greedy. There we go. Yes. All right. Well, now let's talk the cotton market. We saw a big technical break last week, $2 down on the cotton market this week, off another 42 cents. Are we bottoming? I hope so. Yes, there seemed to be some resistance or some some support there at that 57 cent level. But the, the whole thing is just not getting a lot of good news. Um, there there was the International Cotton Association announced, you know, their projections that total global production would go down 15 percent. So you would have liked to see a bullish response in the market, but it didn't happen because there is so much fear about Asian demand. You know, we're still expecting to see very large inventories of cotton. So to have bullish news like that come in and then not get a response, you know, long term, that's that's not a really great uh, signal to the market. OK, so wait and see here on this cotton market, probably continued move to the downside as U.S. producers plant more? I think there's support here, and particularly if the dollar can move lower. I mean, you, you could expect to see that bounce along some of these other ag markets, but, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not expecting to see a major change. Okay. Now let's take a look at the livestock markets. We've seen uh, pretty decent rallies across the board here in livestock this week, stable to a little bit lower, 65 cents on live cattle. Where do you see this live cattle market headed as we get into uh, this month of March? Well, this is a really interesting time frame, right? We're hoping to see a seasonal rally in beef prices and beef demand, and certainly we're looking forward into summer. That, I think, is really going to be the key of whether or not, you know, you look out on the futures strip and they're expecting to see $120, you know, dollars a hundred weight down in August. So is, the, is it going to get that bad? Uh, 
I hope not. I hope that what's going to happen is this summer, the U.S. consumer, with all the extra money in their pocket um, from not having to pay so much for fuel, they're going to go out and grill a bunch and buy a bunch of beef. And so that could really spark some excitement in the market. It tried. The futures market, the nearby futures, really tried this week, but couldn't find buyers above 140. So if you can't make that happen and we don't see what I'm expecting to happen this summer, if it doesn't show up, then yeah, I mean, we, we could have a bearish trend all the way through the year. But this is really the cusp. I think we're on the cusp of deciding one way or the other what direction this Fed cattle market can go in. Watching that resistance at 140, is it going to take something as important as cash sales at or above 140 to drive the futures higher? I think or so. Or up over that level? Yeah, so y you're right. It should be a cash-driven market. And the speculators are net long, so they have been buying. It just we, we weren't able to find anybody willing to buy above that 140. If you could spark something above that 140, you could hit some stop orders. Or you could hit some sort of algorithmic trading because you've moved past a, a resistance resistance level. So it certainly could be the spark. Sure. Okay. Well, then let's talk feeder cattle. We've seen decent demand out there for feeder calves. Is that going to put some legs under this market uh, as we move through the spring? I think it's going to have pressure. I think that uh, the calves that are coming on the ground now, you know, we're probably going to have an expectation for this herd, this calf crop to follow the herd growing by two or three percent. So, and, and that's really the big part of the feeder equation or the, the feed lot equation. That's 70, 80 percent of, of their mass that they're putting into that. So I think they're going to push back pretty hard as we're going through 2016. And I think there's going to be, yeah, like I said, a pushback and not want to pay these prices. There's still some tightening of the belt from last quarter of 2015. Yeah. The guys are going to be yeah. penciling a little harder before I think they so. write the check. Yes. Okay. Do you have a, a downside, maybe area of support that oh, we could keep an eye on? I don't want to think about it. I mean, I okay. think, uh, I know I don't really have a good number for you. I, I mean, I, I, again, I hope that the entire sector will get a boost here from the U.S. consumer. But if they don't, I mean, the whole thing could kind of uh, tail off into the summer, sure. Okay. Well, now let's talk lean hogs. Incredible rally. We we seem to be hanging out up here at $70 on the nearby. Can we move this thing any further? You talk about incredible. I mean, it really is. There's, there's no really good justification. There's this nice higher trend in, in hogs. They're, they're higher year over year, but they have no good reason to be. I mean, we've had no disease pressure this mm -hmm. winter. Um, that herd is expanding, more pigs per litter, you know, lots more efficiency in the entire industry. Every fundamental you think, thing you think about it is bearish. Uh, Asian demand for pork is so uncertain so that's kind of bearish. I mean, uncertainty is always going to make people step back on the gas. Uh, so it's incredible. It makes me a little suspicious. I think that prices hopefully won't fall apart, but they might taper off. This trend might taper off. So this in here, this is a selling opportunity. Absolutely. How far out does this look like a, a selling opportunity? Would you be selling well out in the deferreds? Yeah, actually. So, yeah, that strip is going to, you know, 80 cents. Um, yeah. I don't know how far out that goes, but absolutely, I would be looking at 80 cents as a good opportunity, given all of the bearish fundamentals that are in that market. Okay. And Elaine, before we let you go, 10 seconds to go. Crude higher or lower this next week? Well, with the dollar state, higher. We want to go with higher based Hi on, the, on the dollar. Yep. All right. Well, Elaine Cub, really appreciate you joining us this week. It is always a pleasure. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but Elaine and I will continue our discussion and answer more of your questions during Market Plus, which you'll find on our website. And we want to remind you that Market to Market may be airing in some different time slots in the days ahead due to PBS fundraising activities. So if you find value in Market to Market, please consider making a pledge and investing in a service that provides you with accurate information and timely market analysis. Thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. 
offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sukup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.